Hi friends, I'm Jack your host of Talking with Famous People. And I'm going to talk about a famous person today, or possibly two of them. Donald Fagan and the late Walter Becker, may he rest in peace. They comprised the band, quote unquote, Steely Dan, which was a a musical effort that began in the early 70s with two graduates of the same music college and from what I can tell in all of my research on this stuff uh, which I've been doing today and yesterday regarding Donald Fagan and interested in his mental processes so to speak Donald Fagan is definitely an INTP and I think he's one of history's great INTPs I watched a very very interesting video uh, and it was called The Lost Gaucho. It's a story so of good. I'm sorry, yeah. It's the story of of the last real Steely Dan soul, uh, studio album called Gaucho. And the process of, by which it was made and how much of a challenge it was and basically how slabically cursed it was. Yeah. It, really it was is. A, a nightmare for that band from the get go because it started out in legal complications. It proceeded into Walter Becker having big life problems concurrently, but like after he'd already recorded the guitar, I guess. Um, he got his girlfriend tragically died of a heroin overdose, and then he got hit by a car on the traction for like six months and couldn't contribute to any of the mixing down and stuff. So Donald Fagan was left uh, to run wild, so to speak. And what resulted was what has to be the most textbook. INTP recording phenomena I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. Donald Fagan, along with Katz and uh, Rogers, the other two guys who uh, were producers, but at, at Donald Fagan's insistence, mm -hmm. did 274 mixes of Babylon Sisters. You heard that right, 274 mixes of it, including... 55 mixes just of the fade out at the end of the song, <laughs> which is the 50 second long fade out. Wow. Now, I mean, I gotta say this about their efforts. They were not in vain. I listened to that song this morning and uh, it literally made me cry. Mm. It was so impressively just right in every sense of the word. Mm. Uh, and it's so, it's so deep without being cluttered. It's amazing. It's an amazing piece of work. 274 mixes. All right, so why, so do we, crazy. You know, what, why do we know this means he's an INTP? One, he's using demonstrative NI concurrently with countervalued NI. Um, you know, to any human being's ear on the planet but his, I'm sure mix 235 was just the same exact thing as mix 274. One of the mixes, apparently, he insisted they redo the whole mix because the in one spot there was a double bass note, and the second of the two double bass notes was slightly lower in volume than the first. In the whole mix, in the whole song, <laughs> that one thing caused him to have him remix it. Yeah. And and uh, you know, there, it's not even clear to him whether or not it ought to be low. <laughs> this is the thing that's clear in in hearing. This, uh, let me pull up the video that I was watching so I can yeah, give, it's it, a really good video, give it to credit and also recommend it because it's a great video. I really enjoyed watching it. In fact, I rewatched the beginning of it. Um, I rewatched the beginning of it at, before I started making this. I rewatched the first nine minutes and nine play, seconds. Play guitar on time out of mind. Stop. Right there. So this guy, uh, Sudion. Pusidium. I think I'm going to actually subscribe to this fellow. I don't, I don't know how often he uploads, but uh, this guy is probably an INTP as well. This Pseudium Su guy, whoever is making this video. He's probably a... Um, INTP. And look, he makes what, two videos a month? 
in a few videos a month. Now, uh, this is Cast, this by its current state. This guy might actually be an INTJ, possibly, but I think he's an INTP. Uh, the guy who makes this, CD Young. Regardless, that video is great. I highly recommend it to anybody. Now, having said all that about that, uh, I want to get back to some of the things that mean Brown Fagan is an INTP. So, that kind of like perfectionism, without really being able to tell whether or not it's actually perfect, is sixth slot in I. In contrast, fifth slot in I with me is, um, I'm an ENTP, it's very different. It's like, I value it highly, but ignore it. And sometimes, I'm like, that's obviously, it's great, but there's this huge glaring error in it, and you just go, blah, 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 blah. anyway, you know, uh, I'll never be, I'll never have that phenomenon occur to me. Now, at the very beginning, when I started producing music as an HP, I did have those sort of phenomena in which my ignoring and I made it so I couldn't really tell what, I don't know if this is, this is better than this or this is better than this. And then I just uh, eventually started going like, I'm going to take change my approach and get more things done rather than fewer things done more perfectly. And that's the approach I ended, I've ended up taking ever since. And that's what I've got hundreds and hundreds of things done, but, you know, nothing like Babylon Sisters, <laughs> uh, which is just this piece of incredibly polished genius, frankly. Some people might not like Steely Dan or might think they're too jazzy or too overproduced or cold, soulless, you know, various things that people might say about, or just fundamentally a bad idea to do any kind of jazz anything fusion. I totally agree, by the way, with all those sentiments, except Delian is the one exception in the entire universe. Mm -hmm. Any you jazz fusion anything, you turn it into to toxic waste, mostly as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. But um of course <laughs> Steelian is the exception that proves yeah. the rule. Yeah. Nobody with Steely Dan seems to have ever been able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. And they pull it off brilliantly. And of course Donald Fagan's first uh, solo album, Nightfly, is just gorgeous, fucking brilliant. Also, interestingly, like, this is how, another way you know he's an HP. He couldn't, he was unable to find anybody to get exactly the drum part he wanted. And remember, this is back before audio things, like, that I use now, like this. If, I, if I'm if i producing something in Audacity now, and I just, you know, sample the kick drum I want, or the, I can do the kicks, you know, separately, and I can move them around. If I open some sort of Let's open uh, this. So it have some drums in it, I'm sure. Now, like if uh, in contemporary audio programs, if you want to move something around, it's super easy. You just go like meh, meh, right? You just go, okay, I want to. Here's a kick drum. I even have the drums all on one track. I don't even have them on separate tracks. These are all mixed together as one thing. So, but if I wanted to move this over a little bit, no problem. If I wanted to move it here and have these ones go there, no problem. I just go piao, piao, right? But they were doing this back before anybody could do that shit. It didn't even exist. Until Donald Fagan was so crazy, like, but I want exactly, I want to hear what it sounds like, like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, that um, he said, can anybody, I need this to happen. Roger Nick, uh, no, what's his name? Mike Nick, Mike Rogers, what's that guy's name? The guy who, the other, one of the producers created this thing called, um, it, it's like the first drum sequencing app, basically. If you, I'll find out the name. This, oh no, that, not on uh, Babylon Sisters, it's on a different song. But uh, it resulted in this Wendell, Roger Nichols, invented this first drum machine, basically. Mm -hmm. And he, it, the drum machine got a uh, platinum record. Listen to this. You want to talk about INTP? You might say this is a perfectionist. It's not a perfectionist. It's NI demonstrative and countervalued. According to Ken Mikaleff in an article in Modern Drummer, from noon till six, we'd play the tune over and over and over again, nailing each part. 
We'd go to dinner and come back and start recording. They made everybody play like their life depended on it. But they weren't going to keep anything anyone else played that night, no matter how tight it was. All they were going was for was the drum track. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about this is, that's what you have to do before digital audio tools existed. If you were an INTP and you wanted to successfully make music. Because it is on the back side of their slot. On uh, the back, back side of their stack. And I is. It means they don't consciously use it. They don't go, hold on, Donald. You know, this is becoming a process of diminishing returns. It's like, the more I get deep into this, the more other possibilities are opened up. And I start, you know, I need to close this down into something very concrete and specific now. But I am going to demonstrate the ability to do that but in this countervalued way where it's super complicated. The liner notes. Look at these liner notes. Oh. What does it say? Let me just put liner notes, gotcha. The liner notes are clearly written by an ITP, and they are uh, written by Donald Fagan and Walter Becker. Now, I don't know if Walter Becker was an ITP, but it wouldn't surprise me if he was. Astute Dan fans may have noticed the atypically long interval between the reissue of the Age album with its sleek new annotation by the artist and by the artist in scare quotes, right? Uh, and the final reissue album in the MCA. Gotcha. It's our pleasure to report to you that in the interval, certain intractable legal and artistic dilemmas have been favorably resolved, and that we are now free to resume and conclude this brief and pungent retelling of the Steely Dan saga such as it was. How unnecessarily wordy. Oh my god. <laughs> if that's not an IDP, I don't know what the fuck is. You know, whoever wrote that shit. And who wrote it? Donald Fagan and Walter Becker. And somebody named Frank Kafka. Now, of course, it, what they mean is they quoted Franz Kafka in the, in the liner notes, so they give him author credit in the liner notes, too. It's, it's just sort of like an INDP joke, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, those liner notes are really long. The first thing we noticed, we put pen to paper. <laughs> okay, completely unnecessary. All those words right there, just get rid of them. <laughs> I'm going to teach you how to ignore, but still value an eye a little more as an absolute value. This is totally countervaluing introverted intuition. <laughs> oh, these words are completely unnecessary. The first thing we noticed when we put pen to paper is that we may have given the actual Asia album proper, somewhat short shrift in the aforementioned new annotation, and as much as the album itself is not mentioned at all until the penultimate paragraph, and then only en passant, as it were, <laughs> to remark that too much had already been written in this regard. They're talking about, <laughs> this is a meta-analysis of their previous paragraphs mention of the former record <laughs> in the liner notes of this record. Oh my god. If that's not any tool function, I don't know what the fuck it is, right? It starts off with <laughs> talking about the previous record and then does analysis about the thing they just said about the previous oh my god. record. And the, the, the words was at, was on Paul song. Is that it? it, it, it in passing, I guess. <laughs> Whereas this is every bit as true now as it was then, nevertheless, we retrospectively suspect that we may have done something of a disservice to those devoted fans who are particularly fond of the Age album, above all others. We also acknowledge that it would be somewhat impertinent, if not downright disrespectful, or even contemptuous, to suggest or imply that being especially partial to the most successful of our old albums at the expense of the other, less successful but also very charming ones, would constitute a failure of imagination on the part of said fans, and perhaps even a betrayal of the essence of the Steely worldview, if such a thing could be said to exist. What the fuck? What? I mean, it makes perfect sense to me, what he's saying, and what he's doing, but I... I have a little more sense than that, maybe. <laughs> I'd rather ignore an eye than actively spit in its face like that. But, um, you know, the guy's an absolute genius. I, all praises do. You know, bow down to Donald Fagan. I'm not trying to diss the guy at all. But that's a INTP nonsense right there. It really is. 
Yeah. Nonsense is a good word for it. Right. It's so... He's, it's just extroverted intuition and tool function. Gone, gone nut, not so overboard. Okay, well that's it. That's why Donald Fagan's an INTP. You know, INTPs, uh, you get a, a shit ton of points for him, okay? It's like, you may remember that, uh, that one Dave Chappelle episode where like they had like the race draft or whatever, sure, I and like Tiger Woods got drafted by, by you know like white people or something, and and then and then, uh, oh yeah, uh, black people drafted Eminem. So they were saying like you know, uh, okay, this we want this one to be a representative of us because we like the this person, you know, so. This is the same thing with type, basically, where INTPs, your team is is like, when you go to draft your representative people, definitely draft, uh, definitely draft Donald Fagan, because he's badass. I agree. The end. <laughs>